chemical displacement. Um, but Prithi Raj is a really smart guy, and what I like is, having injected the saline, he left it twitching. Okay, there were no twitches to see. But as the saline dissipated in the tissues, the twitches came back. And with air, it took about 10 seconds for the twitching to reappear. So you inject the air, the twitches go away for 10 seconds and then reappear as the air dissipates in the tissues. For saline, it's slightly longer, it takes about 15 seconds, and the twitches come back at the same strength. With local, it was a bit different. It took 90 seconds for the twitches to reappear, and he needed 50 times more current to produce twitches than he did before. So what Prithi Raj said is, this is evidence that within this minute and a half, the local's beginning to have some effect on the outside of the nerve, making it more difficult to, to stimulate. This is potentially clinically important, because if you're doing some kind of multi-injection technique, like an auxiliary block using a stimulator, it's possible that your first injection of local will start to muck up your second twitch. You find the median nerve and then you, then you go looking for the radial. So, if when you're looking for your second nerve you're not seeing what you expect to see, you should just give up. If it looks okay, if you're getting nice twitches at a sensible current, okay, carry on. But this is one reason why once you slosh some local around, it's possible that it could queer the pitch for you for, for later. Okay. So that was the 1984 theory. And their problem was they didn't try it with dextrose. People have done studies more recently where they have looked at dextrose, and with dextrose, the twitch carries on. You put a needle next to the nerve, you've got your motor response, you inject dextrose, and the twitch carries on as if nothing was going on. The difference between local anesthetic and saline is that they're conductive solutions, and this is non-conductive. And the current idea as to why the twitch disappears, and that explains why it disappears so quickly. I mean, have you noticed that all you have to do is put pressure on? Basically, all you need is one or two drops to come out the end of the needle, and the twitches go. And what's happening is that the conductive solutions are changing the current density at the tip, which doesn't happen with the dextrose. So, here's your needle with densely packed current around it at the tip. When you put your blob of saline or local around it, this is all redistributed around the world. It's almost like you shape the tip of the needle like the blob of local that's coming out the bottom of it. So the current density around the needle tip drops dramatically, and that's why you lose your twitches. And that happens with saline or with local. With dextrose, You've got your needle, you've got your tip, you've got your current density. You put your blob of dextrose out, and the current, because it's not conducted to the outside, it's all concentrated at the tip, it carries on. So if you're asking an exam, why does a twitch disappear? This is probably the more acceptable explanation, is that the conducting solutions effectively reduce the current density at the tip and therefore stop, stop producing a motor response, whereas the de dextrose doesn't. Um, they've shown this in sort of gel electrophoresis type models. I mean, you've done some, haven't you, Alan, where you can look at the electrical field and as you inject various substances and a needle stuck in it. What, what kind of gel did you use? Um, so you can show this quite elegantly um, with electrical field studies in, in gels. So that's the current sort of injection. There's one clinical correlate with this in terms of what the Americans do. If you're using a stimulating catheter, which we don't use here, we haven't, we haven't even gotten them. Some Americans like to use catheters, but they like to have a stimulating tip so they can play with it. I'm not sure, I mean, it's never really taken, is there anyone in the UK using them? It's very expensive. Isn't it? no, very expensive. Um, but the idea is that if your block's not working tomorrow, you can, you know, it's a bit like fiddling with an epidural, you can fiddle with your tip, you can turn the stimulator back on and pull your needle back probably not push it in because this would be dirty, but you know, you can play with it a bit and see if you can get your twitch back. If you're using a stimulating catheter, they suggest that you flush it and manipulate it using dextrose so that the stimulating tip will still work. That's the only clinical note for, 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 for the properties of dextrose. So yeah, there will be, there'll be two Americans in the whole of America who use stimulating catheters and swear by dextrose um, to manipulate it.
In terms of easy injection, we talked about why it's important to have um, an easy injection, and that really relates to where's the needle tip. And Vladimir Hadic has done some stuff with um, nerve preparations where they've put the needle deliberately in a variety of locations in or near nerves and seen how much pressure you need um, to inject. And the bottom line is that if you're extra neural, it's a low pressure injection. If you're perineural, i.e. you're just inside the nerve but you're not in the, in, 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 in the axons themselves, you get a relatively low pressure injection. If you get into actual nervous tissue, you need up to 25 psi to do the injection. And if you look at some of their graphs, this is where they've put a needle deliberately close to a nerve. And this is injection pressure in psi. And this is how long they're injecting for. And you've got you know, some very low pressure injections. If you put the needle into the nerve, you get two types of pressure wave when you start injecting. And when they did their deliberate intraneural needles, they couldn't be sure whether the needle was actually in the packing around the axons in the stroma or in the fascicles itself. But what they found was that they either got a low pressure injection with the physical needle inside the nerve, which didn't cause any damage. And they said, okay, the needle's in, it's intraneural, but it's not in any of the nerve bundles. It's just, it's just expanding up and down the length of the ax of, 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 of the packing in the nerve. And it's not causing any trouble, and you get a great block. My world record femoral block is 72 hours. Scared the hell out of me, so scared the patient. Um, and it wore off after half an hour. And I think your fantastic blocks that last much longer than you really want are probably, I think I've been doing intraneural injections for years, but because I've not been damaging the fascicles, I've just been injecting inside the nerve, um, you get a really rapid, great block that lasts forever. But some of them, they've got these huge spikes of pressure, that's 30, that's 45 psi. And these were damaged animals, these were dogs, these, these got damaged. So if you put a needle into a nerve deliberately and have a low pressure injection, you fill the nerve up with local, you're not damaging nervous tissue, you get a very good block that lasts a long time, and these animals aren't, aren't damaged. The ones that had the very high pressures, this is where the needle has actually gone into the ner nerve fascicles, which is a tight space, and you need these high pressures to inject. So if you need these sorts of pressures, by definition, you've got to be in the nervous tissue itself. And that's where they're... Because have you heard 25 psi before? 20 psi is being the deal. Um, about here, that's about where 25 psi is. You can actually buy a device in America that will pop off at 25 psi. So you put it in your syringe um, needle assembly, and as you increase the pressure on the syringe, if you get to 25 psi, this little thing pops up with a red danger flag on it. Um, for obvious reasons, we don't use them here. But the deal is, high pressures are bad for you. But the reason I don't like 6 foot 4 ODP, so I don't know, is could you see how the pressure falls down again? This is a few seconds. So you have a few seconds of 40 psi, and then bang, the pressure falls, and then you get a low pressure injection again. What do you think is going on there? you've ruptured the, um, the fascicles and you're, ba you're back to the equivalent of this injection. But this is all over in the first few mils. So if you put your needle into the nervous tissue, into a fascicle, and try and inject really hard, for a split second you'll get a very high pressure until you manage to explode it and then it'll feel like a nice easy normal injection. So you really need to pick up that pressure in the first few mils which is why you want slow, gentle injections. I, I don't try and explain this to the people I don't work with. The people I work with often, I, they, they know about this, but the other ones, I just want them to be as gentle as they can. Um, and I don't know what it is. Some people are determined they get 20 mils in there. It's like there's a record. I've got to get 20 mils in in four seconds. Go! And it's like, you know, 
This is the danger period, the first couple of mils. If you can keep the pressure low the first couple of mils, you'll probably be okay for the rest of the injection. Okay. Are you happy with that in terms of low pressure? What happens if you don't get pain? No pain means you definitely won't get an, an, any nerve damage. There are lots of people who've had injections into nervous tissue when they're wide awake didn't feel any pain. These are conduction blocks, but the same applies to um, peripheral nerves. Some people will get pain and it's helpful. If they don't get pain, that doesn't mean you're not, you're not doing damage. Okay. That's about the end of it for now. Um,